Welcome to Photosynthesis, a wonderful orchestration of chemical reactions that makes up the base of our food pyramids. To understand how plants have evolved to do photosynthesis, it's first necessary to understand the specialized plant anatomy that makes photosynthesis possible. Here are the goals of this lesson. Pause the video if you want to check them out. At the start of photosynthesis is a great time to put things in perspective. Now, we've talked about photosynthesis in our ecology unit, where the trophic level of autotrophs, our producers, use photosynthesis to make bi biomolecules for themselves. Biomolecules that are food like glucose, as well as biomolecules that serve as building blocks for other plant structures. Higher trophic levels then kind of steal from plants when they eat the plants. The products from photosynthesis are passed up the food chain when plant biomolecules make their way from one consumer level to the next to the next. But now that we've added some more knowledge about chemical reactions, we can appreciate that the chemical reactions of photosynthesis are endergonic anabolic reactions. The energy to power these reactions comes from the sun, and the principal molecule built, glucose, stores that light energy as chemical energy in the chemical bonds of glucose. What's pretty magical about photosynthesis, besides the fact that sun's energy is actually stored as chemical energy, is that photosynthesis makes sugar from water and carbon dioxide. That's crazy to me. And in this process, plants also make oxygen, which is arguably just as important to life on Earth as glucose. Well, let's check out photosynthesis as a chemical equation. Using the energy input from light, photosynthesis puts together six carbon dioxides and six waters to make each glucose molecule. And along the way, six oxygen molecules are made as well. Now, the main focus of this video is what specialized structures plants have to get in the reactants of photosynthesis. Simply put, plants get water in through their roots, carbon dioxide through structures called stomata in plant leaves, and to a lesser extent, in their stems, and finally, plants have chlorophyll to absorb light's energy. The chlorophyll is concentrated in chloroplasts, and chloroplasts are organelles that are concentrated in plant leaves, but we'll get into that more a little bit later. Right now, let's get into more detail about those roots. We know from our ecology unit that plants absorb water through their roots. But look at how beautifully evolution has shaped the roots in different plants to do their awesome job at absorbing water and nutrients. Roots have branches. Even, even this root, which is a big old tap root, has some branches in it. But you can see all of the beautiful branches um, in this root right here and this root from a, a new seedling as well. Now, the branches help increase the surface area and branch out to get water from more places in the soil than if there was just one big root. Roots also anchor the plants into the soil, and then the root branches have branches, and those branch branches have branches, and finally, roots can have the tiniest little cute branches called root hairs. Now, all of this branching serves to increase the surface area, so the more exposed surface means more opportunity to absorb water from the soil. And let's not miss this opportunity to make a connection back to water potential. Now, remember that water flows from areas of high water potential to areas of low water potential. Plants have to keep the water potential of their roots lower than the water potential of the soil to keep that water potential flowing into the plant. Once the water gets into the plant, the water's journey isn't over. Plants need to get the water to the leaves where photosynthesis reactions take place. So plants have a specialized transport system called the vascular system. The vascular system is the veins of the plants that work a lot like the vascular system in our bodies, made up of arteries and veins. I want to point out a few specialized structures here. The xylem, the phloem, and the bundle sheath. Together, these three structures are called the vascular bundle. The xylem part, which is indicated right here by the X and labeled 
in these other um, diagrams as well, xylem is re responsible for moving water. Water gets from the roots to a plant's leaves by following a xylem that starts in the roots, goes up the stem, and then through a leaf's of veins, and then branches off of that um, main part of the vascular system in the leaf to smaller branches of the vascular system, and uh, finally to all of the leaf tissues. Now to do this, plants have to keep the water potential getting progressively lower. So the water potential of the roots is lower than the soil, like we said in the last slide, but the water potential of the stem is even lower than the roots, and the water potential of the leaves is lower still. Right next to the xylem is the phloem, labeled with a P in this diagram, and the phloem has a different job. The phloem is in charge of moving sugar around. Sugar is made during photosynthesis, and then that sugar travels all over the plant to where it's needed, and sometimes even um, in the ground, in the root, where sugar can be stored or stored in something big like a, a potato. And uh, that sugar travels through the vascular system in the phloem. Finally, the bundle sheath are specialized cells that wrap the xylem and phloem together. Importantly, the bundle sheath keeps air bubbles out of the xylem and phloem because air bubbles can prevent efficient transport of sugar and water by blocking transport of those things. Let's move on to how plants get the second reactant, carbon dioxide. Plants have pores in their leaves called stomata. To be clear, stomata are the holes, kind of like how your, your nostril is a hole. And just like your nostril is bordered by nose skin, stomata are bordered by epidermis cells. And the specialized epidermis cells that border the stomata on either side are called guard cells. So there's two guard cells per stomata. Now, stomata are the holes where carbon dioxide comes in, but oxygen and water vapor can also exit through stomata as well. And it's worth noting that on most land plants, stomata are more highly concentrated in the bottom of the leaves. And this is because water vapor that exits through the leaves um, would exit at a higher rate if stomata were on the top. So having stomata on the bottom of the leaves helps conserve water. On land, water availability can be really unreliable. Plants never know when it's going to rain. Now, what's a little bit confusing is that this slide names stomata in a couple of different ways. Um, we've got stoma here, we've got stomate, and I've been staying, saying stomata. Now, stoma and stomate are the singular for these structures, and stomata is plural. But at our level, it's okay to use all three of these terms interchangeably, so don't get stressed out about that. Stomata in guard cells are really cool, some of the most fascinating structures um, in plants, and I would argue in all of biology. Remember, stomata are the holes, and those holes can actually be opened and closed based on the status of plants and guard cells. You see, guard cells can change shape depending on if the guard cells are flaccid, without that much water, or turgid, filled with water. And now, this is because it's pointless to get a bunch of carbon dioxide if there's not enough water around to react with carbon dioxide for photosynthesis. So, when water is scarce, the guard cells become flaccid and stomata close, and not that much carbon dioxide can get in. But, when there's abundant water, look out, the guard cells change shape, and the guard cells are now turgid, and you see that this stomata opening is huge, and that allows carbon dioxide to flow in, and let's get that photosynthesis moving, because we've got abundant water and abundant carbon dioxide. Once water and carbon dioxide are in place, we just need that last reactant for photosynthesis, the oh-so-important sunlight. Sunlight is captured by chlorophyll, which is in chloroplasts, and chloroplasts are in most plant cells, but the chloroplasts aren't evenly distributed. Well, let me show you on this cross-section of a leaf. So there's a couple different pictures here so that you can see a couple representations. A leaf has epidermis cells as its skin on the, on the top and the bottom, and epidermis cells are specialized as the upper epidermis and the lower epidermis. 
And then the cells um, on the inside of the plant, well, there's those bundle cells that we talked about before, but the other cells are called mesophyll cells. We have palisade mesophyll cells that are up here and spongy mesophyll cells that are a little bit lower. Now, a spongy mesophyll gets its name because it's spongy. There's a bunch of gaps in here, and those gaps in spongy mesophyll are really um, important at creating space for carbon dioxide to hang out in. Palisade mesophyll, however, gets its name because it kind of looks like a fence. So this fence down here is called a palisade, where there's a bunch of stakes. And you can see that these palisade cells line up side by side, like the logs that make up this palisade fence. Anyway, palisade mesophyll is at the top of a leaf where the sun strikes down. And because the sun strikes here, palisade mesophyll have more chloroplasts than the other cells. Concentrating the chloroplasts at the top of the leaf helps plants capture sunlight's energy more efficiently than if the chloroplasts were evenly distributed all over the place. I have thrown a ton at you really quick, so let's take a minute to catch our breath. So plant leaves have a lot of stuff going on. First, we talked about the vascular bundle in a leaf um, with the xylem and the phloem transporting water and sugar and the bundle sheath holding it all together. Next, plants have an upper and a lower epidermis. And uh, the epidermis, especially the lower epidermis, has gaps in it called stomata, which uh, bring in carbon dioxide and let out oxygen and water. And there are specialized lower epidermis cells called guard cells that flank the stomata, which help open and close the stomata. And finally, uh, we got to the mesophyll. Palisade mesophyll is towards the top and has a lot of chloroplasts. Spongy mesophyll is underneath and has a lot of gaps to store carbon dioxide. I want to spend the rest of the video talking about chloroplasts, the organelles in plants specialized for collecting light energy and the actual site of the photosynthesis reactions. You can see that chloroplasts have a lot going on. The green part of the chloroplasts are the parts that have chlorophyll. These green structures are called thylakoids. Thylakoids are on the very inside of chloroplasts and kind of look like a, a stack of coins or a stack of green Oreos. If we take a closer look at chloroplasts, we can see the double membrane of chloroplasts that we talked about with endosymbiosis in our macroevolution unit. And like mitochondria, the membranes of chloroplasts are called the inner chloroplast membrane, the outer chloroplast membrane. But the part that we need to focus on is the very inside of chloroplasts. The compartment inside the inner chloroplast membrane is called the stroma. The phase of photosynthesis, called the Calvin cycle, happens in the stroma. Also inside the stroma are the stacks of thylakoids. A thylakoid is a single unit, like a single coin or a single Oreo here, um, and a whole stack of thylakoids is called a granum. Now, thylakoids have a membrane of their own called the thylakoid membrane, and inside of the thylakoid membrane is a space called the thylakoid space. Let's look at all of those membranes and layers through a different perspective. Now, the outside of a plant is called a cell wall, and inside of that there's the layer of the plasma membrane, and then the the stuff inside of the plasma membrane is the cytoplasm. Now, here's the, the boundary of the chloroplast, the outer chloroplast membrane with the inner chloroplast membrane inside of that and the intermembrane space in between. The part that's really important to us is the space inside of the inner membrane called the stroma. That's all of this kind of clear part in here. And then we've got the thylakoids with their own membrane called the thylakoid membrane and the space inside of thylakoids called the thylakoid space. The places we'll really be focusing our energy on are the thylakoid membrane, which contain the enzymes that support the light-dependent reactions of photosynthesis, and the stroma, which have all of the uh, parts that we need for the second phase of photosynthesis called the Calvin cycle. So let's recap here. 
remember the big picture. Autotrophs like plants or algae use photosynthesis to make food, which we'll call glucose, and other building blocks for themselves. Other organisms take advantage of plants' ability to make these building blocks because heterotrophs can't make them by themselves. Plants have specialized structures that were the focus of this video to help the plants be really good at getting the reactants for photosynthesis to the leaves. Plants are able to get water because they have specialized roots and a specialized transport system called xylem. Plants are really good at getting carbon dioxide because they have specializations like stomata, guard cells, and spongy mesophyll. Finally, plants are able to efficiently capture energy from the sunlight and other light sources because they have palisade mesophyll at the upper part of their leaves. Those palisade mesophyll cells are rich in chloroplasts, and chloroplasts have special adaptations of their own. I can't wait to dive into all of the particulars of photosynthesis with you. I'm glad we got this started.